the 20th episode of The Fourth Podcast. My name is Ali Wazir. My name is Ibrahim Ali. And my name is Talha Mohammed. And welcome back. Uh, today we're going to be talking about a subject that is very sensitive. So I'm going to go ahead and lay out a disclaimer for all of our listeners out there. Uh, we're going to be talking about subjects like sexual assault, rape, um, individuals in our communities that perhaps uh, we should be on the lookout for. So I just wanted to lay out that disclaimer that, that hopefully... If you don't feel comfortable with anything or if you're feeling any form of emotional outcry towards any of this, feel free to go ahead and pause it, uh, pause it or uh, stop if you'd like. Now onto the podcast. Uh, yeah. One or two incident, another disclaimer, which is that none of us technically like are experts in talking about this or anything. Uh, uh, we, we don't have the right expertise, but going back to the function of the podcast, which is just us three guys occasionally with a guest having a having a discussions on things that are pertinent to us in our community from from our perspective i want to so. i want to insert another disclaimer <laughs> yeah i am really stupid <laughs> <laughs> so if that's, i say something uh, stupid. that's a valid disclaimer uh, so uh yeah just uh, take this for what it's meant to be uh as a as a listener i think exactly we are just three individuals just like you the listener trying to cope with the realities of our world today and just discussing them as friends in what we hope to be a safe environment. So hopefully you guys can benefit from it and also join in on the discussion. Um, you can go ahead and contact us on Instagram or Twitter as well if you feel uh, any any need to chime in on the discussion as well. And uh, we'd be more than happy to like uh, follow up and uh, do some more discourse with anyone else who uh, who'd like to. Yeah. All right. With that, let's get started. Yeah, Ali, man, you start us off, bro. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you're it, the, the least stupid of nah. people over here. So today we're going to be discussing a, a very recent report that's come out that's been a massive shock to our community in general. And it's published by an organization called FACE, which is called uh, FACE is an acronym, which stands for Facing Abuse in Community Environments. And the FACE report essentially elaborates and describes uh, an individual, his name is uh, Audi, don't have to correct me if I'm wrong on the pronunciation of his name, uh, Fate, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's his name. Uh, Audi Fate, and he um, essentially has allegations of sexual misconduct and um, certain, certain rape allegations and also uh, drug allegations against him. And this is a public report. It's made public to literally everyone individuals just just as another disclaimer i know we've mentioned five of them at least now <laughs> uh can can go in and read it if you'd like um regarding the the allegations against him which are drug facil- facilitated sexual assault sexual assault sexual battery physical abuse and also spiritual abuse so it's a massive topic and it's something that first and foremost isn't discussed very often in our communities and it's something that we uh, we would like to discuss today so we're going to be discussing first and foremost, face as an organization, what their role is, I guess, per se, in regards to these type of situations. And also, how do we as a community react towards it? How do we take the necessary steps to be proactive rather than reactive whenever these situations occur? And also, how do we touch the hearts of our community members in order to make them recognize the severity of such situations when they do occur? First, why don't we like start with like, what do you guys think of the report? Like each, like, like what are your thoughts? On yeah, that? I mean, like, is it is it good that it came out? Like, what was it? <laughs> that's, that's, what, that's, that's called a loaded question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a fifteen page report, right? Whether or not you think that's uh, long, it's like it's up to your discretion. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, it essentially outlines each allegation against him, right, mm-hmm. and details um, you know the the events that took place within each allegation and. Whether or not they're substantiated, which most of them, according to face, at least are. Um, but all, yeah, if you wanted to go ahead and share uh, your thoughts. As, oh, as oh you want me to start? I, I mean, I, I can start, man. Uh, that's not a problem. I can start. Okay. okay. Um, so first and foremost, you have to look at whether or not face is an organization that should be publishing this report, right? Now, if the allegations are true, which we're still dealing with that, right? The veracity of the report itself. And the veracity of the allegations, actually, not necessarily the report. Um, 
Hang on. Before yeah. you get there, I just okay. wanted to, yeah. <laughs> uh, r- right off the cuff, the phrasing on like your first uh, concern or, nice. or point really uh, is should face be publishing this report? And exactly. I wanted to clarify yeah. what you mean by that because mm-hmm. there's two possible meanings. One is that you're asking, does face have like the authority or the credentials to publish this report? Mm. Or secondarily, do you think that uh, uh, should face be like publicly publishing this report or should they like keep it private? Both. Which one? Uh, both. Okay, so <laughs> let's discuss both, both then. Yeah. Um, so first, first and foremost, to go to your first point mm-hmm. was whether or not they have any credibility to actually publish this report, right? They're not a legal organization, correct? In the sense that they can't, they have no legal jurisprudence to actually do anything. Okay. Right. 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 Um, they're so not a court. They're, they're not a court. They're mm-hmm. not. It's not like they're a bunch of lawyers that are going to, um, you know, conduct any form of criminal justice or even civil justice towards them. Mm-hmm. In fact, the report, from what it seems, apparently, is just to raise public awareness, right, and effectively remove this man from public positions or working massages or other organizations. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I kind of have an issue with that is on what basis, who, and who is the correct authority to even first and foremost, research this, look into it, and then go public with it. Right. Because the issue of going public is, as you mentioned, is also another thing, like whether or not you need to be telling uh, people about such a traumatic uh, the traumatic experiences of other individuals, uh, just simply because that can trigger other individuals' uh, prior experiences of sexual assault and trauma and rape. And then also, communities around the globe are not necessarily prepared with a crisis response team to handle that mm-hmm. if that occurs, right? And that's that I know, even to this day, Muslim communities are still dealing with the stigma and the concept of mental health being taboo in the first place. Right. So it's a massive issue in regards to how big do you propagate it and also whether or not you can take action on it and is it even worth taking action upon because of the benefits and the and the pros and the cons of it as well so it's a lot it's a lot to take into i mean account before we go into like maybe the negative aspects mm-hmm. before like i think there's a lot of benefits to like such a report coming out um, okay, like, like, you want to do like a plus delta? Everybody say one thing that was good about it. Take the stick. This is serious stuff, but I'm just gonna say it. Like I cope with a lot of this stuff through humor, so I apologize if that doesn't vibe with with any listener. But you know, I do take this stuff seriously. It's just my way of dealing with it may be different than yours. Um, yeah, but what I was saying is that um, I I think it's. It's definitely necessary for, well, I mean, you mentioned that there's no legal, like, binding behind this this report, right? This guy's not going to go to jail uh, because of this report. Um, but, I, but I think that to a certain extent, um, ideally, should it have a, a, a legal backing? Yes. But, I mean, for now, I, I personally think, and I, and I can't speak to... Uh, people who may be like uh, like triggered by the mention of like sexual assault or rape or anything like that in this report, but I I personally think that it's beneficial to have these uh, allegations brought out fr- out forth so that people can know to avoid this like situations and circumstances where this guy is uh, like involved with or cert- like yeah where he's going to be there. Or, just to know that, you know, these are things that have come up before. And, like, if you have uh, X amount of allegations, right, like Deshaun Watson, for example, like, mm-hmm. he, that man had 22 different allegations against him. Mm-hmm. I was like, you know that at least one of those is correct, right? At least one of those has to be, uh, like, like, you don't agree with that? No, not necessarily. Uh-huh. Uh, I mean, just because 22 people come out and say something against you doesn't mean that you did it like you have to look at the content of the allegations right Mm -hmm. like it's it's my way of thinking about it anyway like uh, to be very honest with you i haven't read whatsoever uh about deshaun watson it was more of like a 
but you know, you see like whether they're corroborating stories, right? Like 22 by itself doesn't necessarily mean anything because it could be like 22 fake accusations, right? I'm not saying that this is the case whatsoever for the record, but it's like you, you just a big number doesn't automatically mean that it's it's true. And I think that we can say that for sure. I think we have to be a little bit more critical in analyzing those allegations each unique allegation in and of itself. Because granted... And, I mean, and is, yeah, looking at them holistically as well, mm-hmm. right? Like, do they corroborate? Is exactly. this establishing a pattern, right? Mm-hmm. Or is it like, you know, people are claiming different things, you know? I mean, I Sean know. Watson is, is his own... I was, I was just, I was just using itself, right? an example. And obviously... He, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Just, no, and I appreciate your point, yeah. but I, I just don't think that you can say just because there's a big number of allegations, it necessarily mm-hmm. means something has happened. Mm-hmm. And I mean, that's my disagreement with with you on that but uh, uh to, please do continue no, no. <laughs> so it's interesting going back to the face report because we're dealing with uh i mean i guess going back to sean watson uh dealing with issues of like sexual assault right and uh, but we're also dealing with issues like misappropriation of funds uh, mm-hmm. we're also dealing with issues like uh and this is serious like a transmission reckless transmission of an std right. hpv right mm-hmm. um so these are massive allegations, and they, which, these, which resulted in cervical cancer for one of the yeah, yeah, yeah. for one of the victims, um, which is early stage cervical cancer. That's correct, um, and it's it's that's just mind blowing. Mm-hmm. You know um, the details regarding the situation. Now my question is going back to okay. Now let's say hypothetically we take a brief stance and we say it's good that they published it we get to know you know that hey perhaps there's an individual out there that you know is doing these evil things what are the practical application of those benefits to you okay yeah. i'm gonna that's i'm gonna take this because that's true. that's where my mind went yeah. first right mm-hmm. and and you both know this mm-hmm. um whenever i first read the report i was happy Mm-hmm. Right. I was really glad that this information had come out and that there was I'd never heard of face before, to be honest mm-hmm. with you. And I was Neither about, yeah. yeah. And I was glad to see that there is an organization out there that is uh, compiling uh, allegations and uh, even like giving like uh, their own verdicts on it, you know, as they say, substantiated, substantiated, mm-hmm. substantiated and so on and so forth um, on on those allegations within the Muslim community, uh, because for me, the practical application of a report like this is that I have uh, three sisters, right, who I care for and uh, feel responsible for, um, especially because two of them are younger than me. It doesn't matter to me if this is like a court or not. You know, I'm just glad to see because I remember hearing about uh, the allegations coming out against him sometime during the pandemic last mm-hmm. year. And I was glad to see that, you know, they've been uh, substantiated by like, these people uh, because I now knew that I can tell my sisters to like uh, to stay away from like if their MSA or their local mosque invites them over uh, then you know just uh, stay away from that you know Uh, don't go and be in a place where this person who has allegations against him could harm you as well that was the practical application of it for me and that was my immediate thought like first thoughts when I when I saw it, and uh, I, I hope that answers your question at least a little bit in terms of like what are the practical applications of it. On the other hand, I was actually glad that it wasn't a court because uh, I am wary of like false accusations going around, and uh, I was glad that Face has like no authority to like put this man in jail or give him some other type of punishment. Or, Which you, or put a head against him, yeah. right? Um, because uh, I I think you'd have to hear both sides out for that and all that kind of stuff, right? But for me, just looking after my own uh, family and the people that I care about, I found it useful in in that scope. Mm. So, yeah, I appreciate that. And I understand that, that point of view. And, and it makes sense. It makes sense for, for any... Man, Dolita, or any man with any form of like, you know, protective desire towards their family members, right, right, to want to be aware of the situations that are going on. Mm-hmm. My only concern is that going back to Ibrahim's example of Deshaun Watson, is that, uh, and and as you mentioned aptly as well, 
what if all of these allegations hypothetically, because we're dealing with hypotheticals, and obviously, I want to make a disclaimer first and foremost to the the victims or the the um, you know the victims of this this man. Uh, if if these allegations are true, first and foremost, that our heart does go out to them, right? And that we as a community need to do better in order to facilitate some form of first and foremost repercussions to individuals that permeate these crimes, right? And also to be more uh, proactive in how we prevent them from occurring. Yeah, I mean, we need to right? do better as a community regardless of, of whether or not... Yeah, whether or not they're taking place. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and, so, and I mean, they're definitely taking place. Oh, yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Th- that's for sure. Yeah. It's just about when you narrow in. Uh, I, I think your mm-hmm. like hesitation right now is like when you narrow in on like one specific individual yeah. and like substantiating those claims, right? Yeah, like so properly. For example, when you do 58 interviews as it did, as right. Face did. Yeah. And your, your only statement for every allegation is a bolded word, ca- all caps, substantiated. Well, you don't even define what that means. Mm. You, you, you can't tell me, like, you, the, nowhere in this 15 page report does it define what does it mean by this allegation being substantiated. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting because just to say that it's substantiated, I mean, me and you could make claims all day. Right, right. right. And I'm not, I'm, not tra- I'm not saying that face is doing that, but mm-hmm. there needs to be a level of academic veracity in regards to what you're propagating. Mm-hmm. And that, that's something that I don't see from the report. Um, they define trauma, which I think uh, anyone that's looking to go into psych- psychiatry should do if you're mm-hmm. attempting to spread this to laymen. Um, but you're dealing, as I said, with spreading an STD, sexual abuse, assault, battery, so on and so forth. Um, I just realized, though, perhaps they, this, if this report was utilized as a resource by the judicial process, it would have actually done more benefit than to just send it out publicly mm-hmm. without having any legal repercussions being done to this man. And it's interesting because the, all of these events have taken place, uh, I think from like 2012, from what I remember, 2011, 2012, up into 2019. Right, right. right? So it's, a, it's about a seven to eight year, almost literal rampage of this man, you know, committing these acts. I mean, like, how many victims are there? It's like at least seven or eight, I think. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And, and over, that, that, that chose to speak yeah. to face. Right? Exactly. Because yeah. they, they weren't able to get hold of some mm-hmm. other people. There's seven victims from, from what the report states. Okay. And 50 interviews, seven victims, um, different, you know, just different instances of where these type of events are taking place. Mm-hmm. My question is, and this is a common question that's asked, right? Right. If your mother, if your daughter, if your sister was sexually assaulted or raped, what would you do? This is an emotional appeal that many people bring to you um, when discussing this report. So I guess my question to all of us here is, what would we do? It's uh, a valid question, right? It's right. a valid question. What would we no, do? No, it's, it's a very valid question. Mm-hmm. And uh, I kind of already answered that. I just, I said... I'd, keep my family away from those individuals. So you wouldn't want any sort of legal repercussion done to that individual? That, that No, if, well, if it happens okay, specifically, well, well, yeah. right? We're, and this is the question. It's supposed to be an emotional appeal to the, to the individual uh, from the questioner to the one being asked. Okay. What would you do if it was your sister? Yeah, and I would. she came to you crying in mm-hmm. tears, bawling that this man had sexually assaulted or raped. I like would absolutely uh, take him to court. So you would want legal action, right? You, I would definitely you would want legal action. You would be calling the cops, you would be going to the hospital, you would be performing uh, the DNA tests, so on and so forth, in right. order to legitimize and to ensure that this act took place to be able to get criminal a like, criminal trial mm-hmm. going against mm-hmm. this man, right? The only reason I wouldn't do that is if, like, uh, this the, the victim of the sexual assault didn't want me to do it. Right. Like I wouldn't force my way over there. Sometimes they don't. Right. Uh, There's many cases of like victims of sexual abuse. who just don't want to live that trauma again. And they're like, Mm. you know, I I, I don't want to do this. And I'd understand that. Mm -hmm. But for any other reason, I would not hesitate in taking that person to court. Deborah, what are your thoughts? Boy, you ain't talking to me. (laughs) (laughs) So I, I understand that entirely. It's just. The natural, I, I, at least from what I've what I've experienced and what I've seen from other individuals, mm-hmm. and this is just anecdotal experience, obviously. Um, and once again, we're not professionals in regards to any of this. Mm-hmm. So, the immediate response from what I've seen from nearly every individual is, 
take them to court. Right. right. Okay. Get a criminal trial processing, you know, undergoing uh, and and attempt to put this man behind bars. So he's never able to first and foremost do it again to my sister, daughter, niece, so mother, so on and so forth. And he's also not able to do it to any other individuals in the community okay. or abroad. Okay. Now you have seven victims that came and spoke to face. Mm-hmm. We but, don't but, but keep in mind yeah, that yeah. not all the victims were of sexual assault. Of course, yeah. yeah. Right? So, yeah. Some of them, as we say, were of uh, misappropriation of funds. Right. Um, and some, I believe, were of, were of battery, um, which some I would still, which I still hope the individual wants. Would get. want to take the yeah. court. <laughs> um, okay, but yeah, continue with your point. So I, I guess my point is, why for seven to eight years did nobody come? And report this man to low at the minimum local authorities. Right? I'm not saying I'm not saying you go and publish it on Instagram and then you you contact your police after that. No, no, no. But like, why would you not just immediately take it to the local authorities? Uh, I think that's a loaded question to to begin with because uh, because I mean you don't know what the what the power di- dynamics of that situation mm-hmm. are. Because I mean, I, I I personally relate to it a lot because I mean I'm aware of situations that where where people were like you know uh, being like abused by someone mm-hmm. and like they didn't say anything for like years on it like and it makes sense because if you're in that situation for so long uh, you don't. It's really hard to come out and like come to the mm-hmm. authorities, and I don't think it's fair to say that. Oh, uh, why didn't uh, someone go to the authorities? It's mm-hmm. not an easy thing to do by any means. Of and course. a lot of these, a lot of these allegations are not specifically about rape. Some of them are about financial uh, mm-hmm. misappropriation, uh, financial uh, misappropriation of funds. Some of them are about uh, they're about various things, right? And uh, the uh, the allegations about sexual misconduct are not. Uh, it's not exclusively about sexual misconduct, mm. so I think that it's not a it's not a fair question to to ask uh, why didn't they go to the authorities? And I think that when they when they found an outlet which was face which was willing to listen to them and keep their anonymity intact mm. and like actually talk to them, I think that uh, that's when uh, or, or, or I think that's why they were able to like give their their, give their side of the story. Yeah. And like historically speaking, Muslim community has seen so many cases of uh, sexual uh, sexual abuse, spiritual abuse, like all sorts of abuse. And I think that uh, having an organization like FACE is definitely uh, a good deterrent, number one. Mm-hmm. And number two is uh, good at just cataloging everything that's happened uh, just so that people know that this is a mm-hmm. possibility. I think that's a valid point that you brought forth that perhaps... Individuals don't necessarily feel uh, as they're going to the authorities. It's the right thing to do based on, as you mentioned, the power dynamics and so on and so forth. Now, going back to face, because that was the last point you mentioned. Is there any way we as a community can perhaps make face even better than what it is? Or are there any, any ideas or thoughts amongst those people of knowledge that you guys have spoken to as well? Uh, in regards to how we can perhaps improve the way we approach these situations. Uh, so, I mean, right before I answer that, yeah, I'm going to say, without trying to pile on on you, Adi, <laughs> that I I really do echo exactly what Ibrahim said, uh, especially like within the context of our community. Obviously, me and I think probably most of the other people that you asked this question to uh, uh, outside of this podcast I feel this way, right? I'd absolutely take him to court. But this is not the prevailing uh, uh, mentality mm-hmm. in the Muslim community, especially with like first and second generation immigrants. Like I'm sitting here as like a third generation immigrant, very, very whitewashed. It, it, you know, if, if you consider if you consider all this kind of stuff like mental health and uh, um, respecting like uh, believing victims and all that kind of stuff to be whitewashed, then, then yes, it is. It is where my mentality sits at. But the, the overwhelming... Uh, response, I think, and that's echoed in the report as well, is that uh, if these victims of sexual assault as women were to go uh, and try to speak to community elders, 
right? Through whom obviously they'd eventually get to uh, local authorities because very few teenagers are going to even know how to go out and like contact the local authorities mm-hmm. about this or if it's even a crime or anything like that, right? The first thing that happens in our community, unfortunately, is that we scrutinize the victim way harder than mm-hmm. anybody else, right? What were you wearing? Oh, why were you out alone with him at night? Oh, why were you even talking to him in the first place? You know? Uh, let me let me see your phone and see what kind of text you guys have been exchanging, right? And uh, uh, that's that's the first thing that happens to any victim uh, of sexual assault in our community who tries to bring it up to community elders in the first place, like uh, which is one of the things that we really, really, really need to work on as a community, uh, no doubt. And I know you agree with me on mm-hmm. that. I do. Yeah. Um, so I think it's really unfair to say that okay, why didn't these uh, uh, victims go out and like make a case against him. I don't think it's something that should disqualify mm-hmm. the report. What's no, no, of course, report? of course. Right. Yeah. And I don't think that it should even bring sc- like them not reporting it to somebody until face reached out to them mm-hmm. should not bring scrutiny upon it, upon the happening of the thing it's mm-hmm. in and of itself. Right. Like obviously scrutiny can be brought upon the retelling of the events, uh, through other means, right? Like if the, if the suspect, uh, um, denies all of it happening and, you know, maybe has alibis or something yeah. like that, then, of course, you know, you, you, you have to look at these things fairly uh, without letting your emotions get involved. But I think the fact that they did not report it for that many years is not something that can be held against them within the context of our community. Of course. And even of law enforcement in, yeah. in the United States and Canada where, yeah. like, these allegations happened, right? Yeah. Like, a, like a ridiculous amount of brown women go to local authorities in, in, in these two countries uh, to report sexual assault happening. And all like, you know, it'll be all white male cops standing over there and they'll be like, yeah, I don't think so. Right. And Fatih mm. Sever uh, uh, Qari Fatih is white, right? He's had the sympathy of the cops right away. Uh, white person. Right. Uh, no, no, he's white. He's from Europe, dude. He is. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. He's Bosnian. They're yeah. He's European. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, <laughs> they're no, white, dude. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, no, I understand. I, right. I, I first and foremost value everything that you say. I think it's valid. I think it's appropriate. Mm-hmm. And uh, I only mention the question yeah. first and foremost because it is a question that people bring up. Okay. Right. I'm not. I'm not saying that's the stance that I take. I just want to clarify that for our listeners as well. Um, that that's something that is brought up very often. First, the emotional appeal, and then also the rebuttal of oh why didn't they take it to the cops Mm -hmm. right in the first place Mm -hmm. um and as you mentioned it is necessary regardless of wherever we are right it can be in japan it can be in brazil it could be here in america um that whenever an individual comes and expresses these feelings expresses these experiences of trauma that they've undergone that we validate their emotions and we recognize that this is a situation that if you're not equipped to handle, you need to get someone that is equipped to handle it. No doubt. Right. It's like if you're going, if you're dealing with someone having a brain hemorrhage, I mean, this is just me speaking from my medical school knowledge. Like if you have someone that, that's having a brain hemorrhage, right, and they're having a hemorrhagic stroke right in front of you, you're not going to use your knowledge. Like your brain's not going to use his knowledge as an engineer to fix it, right? He's going to go and call. He's going to take you to the ER. They're going to get a neurosurgeon. Yeah. They're going to get the appropriate individual to fix that. And this is more or less for our listeners, I know you guys know this, that when it comes specifically to issues of mental health, trauma, rape, sexual assault, drug abuse, so on and so forth, being that semi-woke friend and saying, oh, you can always come to me, it doesn't do jack, bro. Like, it doesn't help. It really doesn't because you're not equipped to handle the situation. And I appreciate, I'm going to I'm gonna be frank, I appreciate Face having psychologists and psychiatrists that work with them. Mm-hmm. I think that's necessary. I think that's valid to have those individuals that are knowledgeable in the specific field where this stuff is so prevalent, right? Where this is literally where people go to seek assistance. Mm-hmm. And I just want to put that out there first and foremost for our listeners that if you know someone that's undergoing these traumas, if you know someone that's undergoing mental health dilemmas or issues, you need to be able to facilitate getting assistance from the proper resources. So that's that was just another tangential point I just wanted to toss out there to ensure that and, I, I mean it, you kind of bring up a good point uh like kind of knowing if people are going through this is like really hard to really hard to tell mm-hmm. because 
you know, uh, a lot of people are quick to like, uh, to like deny it or, or like if someone comes out with like these, these allegations of any, any, any sort of abuse, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to put a, a specifier on it, but, um, if you, if anyone comes out with like, uh, with like allegations of this, like the first thing people are like, oh, why didn't you come out with, like, like you said, like, oh, why didn't you come out with this before? Like, 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 like you also said, like, like, oh, what were you wearing? Like, what are the text messages that you guys were sharing? But like, I mean, when someone is undergoing abuse, like none of these things really matter. Like there's a huge exploitation from the, from the abuser to the person who's being abused. Um, and it's kind of, it's, it's definitely hard to, hard to explain. And uh, kind of knowing if someone is going through that requires a kind of throwing back to like one of our previous uh, episodes where we talked with, uh, with, with Jake Mikhail in that, in that season. Yeah. About, like emotional intelligence mm-hmm. it, like, it requires a huge amount of emotional intelligence to like know whether someone is going through uh going through someone something or not and like using the title of that uh of that season like what are the silent messages that these people are throwing out right that we may, maybe we're missing and like we don't know uh that what's going on and, like how we're we responding to those messages like do we like do we like actually like react to them and do we like respond and like uh facilitate things for them to get out of that situation or is it just like something that is like uh that's like look past and that's just damn bro you just went deep on us so uh, kind of pivoting on to another important facet of this discussion Claudio Fate has actually responded to this not publicly but he has actually discussed his stance on what he believes to be and a campaign of character assassination on him. Mm. And I just wanted to know y'all's opinion. Um, granted, as we said, we're not entirely knowledgeable. We're not even remotely close to the investigation that took 13 months to compile. Right, right. right. Um, and his stance is, and I quote him, to clarify, to clarify, sorry, I have never been approached by any law enforcement agency regarding these allegations. They have been fabricated and propagated by an organization that has an agenda and no legal authority. I can also confirm that I have never been directly approached by the organization in question during the course of their, quote, investigation, unquote. They only reached out 48 hours before releasing the report, which was published after a year-long campaign of harassment and slander. I refuse to engage with an organization that, by law, has no authority and has actively sought to malign my character without providing me with an opportunity to respond, the insincerity of this organization is clear to see. So what are your thoughts on, uh, and that's just one quote from three to four different yes. paragraphs that you wrote. Very gaslighting. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna start <laughs> off with that. Do so you uh, define it as gaslighting? Very much okay. so, because, okay, so, having a law enforcement approach you, like, sure, but like, what bar is that, like, what bar is that setting? Because first of all, like the law enforcement is a huge perpetrator of these abuses, uh, like systematically to begin with. So like saying that, you know, they reached out to, I mean, they let so many cases of uh, sexual assault and sexual abuse, they just let them slide. Uh, and it's been like clearly documented throughout the years that, uh, that, uh, that, you know, that these enforcement agencies are corrupt and they are complicit in a lot of these actions. And uh, secondly, I think the only appropriate response from anyone who's like being accused uh, to uh, accuse of these things is uh, is to I don't know if you remember actually I forget who exactly it is but there was someone who was being accused of sexual assault and they were like being considered for a cabinet position or like wow. a, uh, someone it was some mm-hmm. political head and okay. and they were like. Uh, they were like uh, the only appropriate response I see was the one that they gave, but I just use that as an example, which is like they they were like we want a full investigation. Like they were like we're not going to comment on this until a full investigation is uh, thoroughly completed and my innocence is proven uh, through that through the result of that investigation. And I think that's the only that's the only way of uh, going, or that's the only way that I I see that is appropriate to. Like respond to these allegations like character assassination and like gaslighty terms like in his response uh i i read that response mm-hmm. actually and I, I it didn't it didn't vibe well with me for mm-hmm. some reason yeah i mean um he has no like duty to uh engage with it right and that's that's his right whether he wants to 
like whenever they ask him for his side like 48 hours before mm-hmm. or i mean in the in the report they claimed that they had reached out to him from before that as well mm-hmm. right they just told him 48 hours before that we're going to release this report within 48 hours so whoever's telling the truth in that case it's not technically like his obligation to to cooperate with them mm-hmm. they're not a, a a legal thing or anything but i think uh um that side of it will just be revealed whenever it's revealed mm-hmm. right either in this life or the next and uh face has said that they are going to like start an actual uh or have already started an actual like civil proceeding okay. with this right i think uh if uh, like I, I read this report whenever it came out mm-hmm. a couple weeks ago uh i'm pretty sure they did say that they were going to like open an actual case against him so whenever that happens i uh expect him to cooperate with that right mm-hmm. because that is an actual legal court in yeah. a country that he's a citizen of or that he's been accused in uh if he runs away from that then i guess we'll have a better idea of what's up uh or if he doesn't and then we get like an actual full case about it um but as for uh face itself i think that it's okay that they didn't uh that that they just published one side of the findings mm-hmm. uh primarily because they don't actually have legal impunity to like act against him and uh it does serve as something very helpful for those of us who have people we care about right like of course imagine uh, whenever you were bringing up hypotheticals that like mm-hmm. imagine yeah. all these have been fabricated right on the other hand imagine that none of them are like all of them are true but that face was like okay we're not getting a reply from him and we don't want to publish our report without uh without uh, w- without having his side of uh, of the story in it and he went another seven years assaulting many other women you know that would also be very very devastating and uh yeah so in terms of uh the other question you asked which we never replied to which is what can face do better i think it's uh i think it's hard for me to say mm-hmm. because of my iq but uh, um uh one thing for sure is like we do need more input from our own scholars as to what as to how our sharia law can be extrapolated to uh find something that works for us in our context regarding these kind of situations right at the same time we don't want to become another freaking catholic church in this country right wait so long to act upon something and the cases are so numerous that you don't even know where to start and you just have to take out the old pope and put in a new one who's in support of lgbt uh right so that so that you can save some face as an organization like i don't want us to have to come to that mm-hmm. right as as sure. as a minority community in this country those are my thoughts on on that mm-hmm. you know as far as as uh, his statement goes like i don't actually think he's under uh any obligation to to reply to it but that's his prerogative mm-hmm. i just expect him to coordinate with whatever uh like legal stuff comes next i guess and i think you touched on something that was a major critique from a lot of individuals mm-hmm. regarding how uh face as an organization went about obtaining this information and who they consulted or rather who they did not consult mm-hmm. and one of the major concerns was where are the scholars mm-hmm. you know we're as muslims that's that's our major concern is where are the scholars in regards to dealing with hot topics like this right and right in addition to the plethora of other hot topics that are not discussed in our community. Right? Oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> we, we are the silent community. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think that's exactly right. Perhaps, Aloha, I think uh, they, they have mentioned that they do have certain shoe mm-hmm. uh, that they... That they ran it by, right? Yeah, but they haven't yeah. released their names, which is... I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know what to think of it. Yeah. Um, I, w- I would really love to hear more from FACE itself mm-hmm. as to their uh, methodology and approaching scholars right yeah, like yeah. like whether they've tried at all mm-hmm. if they have who they've tried mm-hmm. with uh yeah you know if they have then what have been the responses from scholars because i you know i humble in our religion we also don't believe that scholars are infallible right course, yeah. like it could be that scholars have just been refusing to 
to cooperate with them, like yeah. hypothetically again. Yeah. It could be that they've been refusing to cooperate with them and that's something that's wrong and will be held against them on, on the Day of Judgment, right? Or it could be that they're cooperating against them for a really good reason, like from the religion. Or it could be that uh, uh, they are cooperating with them and just want to remain anonymous or that face hasn't reached out to them at all. Uh, these are like a lot of unknowns out there, right? I mm-hmm. feel like uh, Iraq in 2003. But um, I would really love to hear more and just get more information. Of course. Right? Like I feel like there's a real black and hole in a lot of the information. Out there. I think the community needs to have this discussion. Oh, an open no, no. discussion. Absolutely. Specifically in regards to, alhamdulillah, I think the, the leaders and the, the forerunners of psychiatry and psychology within the Muslim community are doing a very good job of promoting the need for recognition and awareness of these issues. It's just perhaps community gatekeepers that might be a little bit hesitant to acknowledge it and recognize it. And even, even now, for example, it is a uh, mental health awareness. Month. And for me, it struck a nerve because we just had national suicide awareness day on September 10th. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was a Friday. And in our communities, obviously, that being the day of Jumar Khutbah, right? You, you can deliver the Friday sermon. And I think, honestly, I never came across any massage in the DFW area that was talking about the topic. It was odd because we as a community are so reactive, we're not proactive, right? I know we talked about how face can improve, but our communities can also improve, right? Mm-hmm. No doubt, we're not, we are also, uh, not infallible and so specifically regarding that uh, the discussion of sexual assault and rape and you know spiritual abuse that door needs to be kicked down and means of communication need to be opened up entirely resources need to be provided perhaps i don't know if if massages are looking into um instilling some form of like a resident psychiatrist or psychologist within them, mm-hmm. you know, because mm-hmm. that's an issue that we're dealing with, right? The the spirituality of the heart and the diseases of the heart that people are dealing with, whether it's drug addictions, um, assault, rape, so on and so forth, so many different things, right? And um, going back to how face can improve, I think perhaps dealing with the you know, getting them scholars, getting them more intertwined with our approach of Islamic psychology and psychiatry and how we deal with these issues is crucial to ensuring that number one, there's a certain level of certification and veracity to it. Mm-hmm. Right. So people are like, Oh, Hey, wait, there's this quote unquote celebrity Sheikh or like there's this recognizable Islamic figure, not, mm-hmm. I apologize. Celebrity Sheikh is not appropriate, but a uh, recognizable prominent Islamic figure that has certified knowledge. Sure. That's advocating for this and recognizing recognizes its validity and importance. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I believe that perhaps inshallah that can be like the next step to taking it to the next level to where people, I know that us as second and third generation individuals recognize its importance, right? And perhaps those first generation individuals like our parents might not necessarily recognize it. For example, a lot of brown kids, they go tell their parents are depressed, it's like go to sleep. <laughs> just go to sleep, buddy. <laughs> you read, sleep. Read, read Quran. Yeah, read Quran, go pray your salah, the salah that you don't even understand like what you're saying. Yeah. Go read the Quran, you don't even understand what you're reading. Um, it's deep, man. And uh, it's, a, it's a much larger topic, but I'm glad that at least oh. we had the discussion. Or, or the other approach. Don't be sad. You know, there are children starving in Africa. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that is good next steps. I think another important next step that we need to take as a community, like when things like this come to light, is who we trust uh, as sources of Islamic knowledge anyway, right? Like it's uh, like the whole time for me reading the report and everything and uh, a lot of the victims were uh, saying that they were hesitant to reach out to community leaders or local authorities Mm -hmm. because of the power dynamic, right? Because of how much of a respected individual uh, Qari Fatih was. Mm -hmm. And it struck struck me as... uh, like pretty sad that that's what the state of the ummah has come to mm-hmm. that that's somebody who is respected in a in a community and his only qualification is that he has like a nice voice and leads to our way in ramadan right 
literally that's it. Like even his Quranic knowledge, uh, you know, with like, like we know that he finally started working on getting his first ijazah uh, just a couple years ago from Kuwait after having led Taraweeh for like 13 years, right? Like uh, that's not somebody who should have like a really high standing in in a in, in an Islamic community that that values its uh, its sciences, right? That values its scholarship because uh, like that's not a qualification, right? You look, you, you put people on a on a pedestal and like have higher hopes of them and like allow them to lead your community when uh, they've gone to like an Islamic university, have memorized a lot of texts, like has spent a lot of years studying mm -hmm. not just Quran, but like other sciences okay. around it as well. Uh, have scholars that who can like vouch for them, mm -hmm. right? Like, like scholarship in Islam is not like scholarship in in Catholicism or or Judaism or something like that. We don't have a central uh, uh, like worldwide Imam council or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, we might, but you know, it's not taken very seriously. Uh, I wouldn't even know if it exists or not. But what we do use is like other scholars vouching for other scholars. And so the fact that he was hired at like two mosques to be like a youth leader and all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. and was ultimately fired from both because of his straight up like incompetence, didn't know what he was doing, mm -hmm. uh, all the stuff that's outlined, not only in the face report, this stuff, this stuff was also like the mosques said it as they let him go, like yeah. early termination, just take all your money and, and leave us like you're not doing anything beneficial mm -hmm. for the community. Why was he put in that position in the first place? Oh, because he has a nice voice. Really? That's mm -hmm. that's that's who we take as our, our community leaders. Even like going back to an older case of like Noman Ali Khan, mm -hmm. he hadn't studied traditionally anywhere, right? Like he was uh, he was straight up like making up a lot of the seed or like very specifically, I remember uh, even before any of like the, the sexual misconduct allegations came out against him, I remember like listening to a sira and I can't remember which one now because I haven't listened to it in so long, but he was like going on for a while about a certain word, emphasizing how it could only have been uh, written in that way, you know, because of all this meaning that writing it in that way brings. But some of the examples that he was giving out, giving like, oh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not choose to use like another variation of the word here. It's like, that's another variation, another qara'ah. Like you can't, you can't make tafsir only from house, right? Yeah. But like, you know, even if he knew of other qara'at, he certainly wasn't incorporating them into his tafsir. Or like Imam Zia in ICI, like what were his qualifications to be mm. an imam? And especially what were his qualifications to be like counseling uh, the youth in the, in the community, like young girls in the community? Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know why we put the wrong people on pedestals. And what we really need to do as a community is like educate ourselves in uh in in what our scholarship actually looks like i think it's uh that's also an important next step hopefully something i think you take just away. touched on something that yeah it's a, it's a massive issue within our community the lack of educational veracity mm -hmm. especially when it comes to this time. yeah um and that's a topic in and of itself that's yeah, massive yeah. right it's something that we can we can honestly do a whole another podcast on. oh yeah for sure <laughs> i mean my my other thought on that would be that you know, we, we've brought it upon ourselves by not respecting the Islamic sciences, right? Mm -hmm. Like, oh, why do you want to become a sheikh? Like, why don't you just go to go become a doctor and, and do this as a side thing? Like, it's not too hard, you know? Like, I <laughs> I read a yeah. translation of the Quran once. Yeah. <laughs> Some surahs yeah. that I like. Like, it's uh, yeah. the, the total lack of respect mm -hmm. for, like, actual Islamic scholarship and respecting, like, the 1400 years that people have put into this is what is going to is what has led us to this situation that we put totally inappropriate people on pedestals and then and then are surprised when they while out and and you know accusations <laughs> like this come I mean, out like people with true knowledge they're not going to do stuff like that. right oh, yeah. right yeah and like it's kind of a little bit of a side point but uh -huh. but like trusting people like with in leadership positions or just trusting people in general is is a really hard thing to do because at the end of the day you really don't know for a fact 100 percent that anyone is or isn't an abuser right mm -hmm. and there's like a certain level of of trust that you need to put not in the person but 
like you said, in their qualifications. Mm-hmm. And w- what happens when you put the trust in the person or the personality is this, this type of stuff starts to happen, right? Either it's like uh, misconduct of, of certain like things or uh, like financial like misconduct or anything like that because people with true qualifications are not going to be the ones that are going to be doing this for the most part. I mean, yeah, yeah, for the most part. For the most know? part. But like at least the ones that I can, I remember in the DFW community, uh, and I'm gonna say their names because it's like well known. Uh, like it's gonna be like Imam Zia, for example, right? Why was he like you said? Why was he counseling people if he had no counseling? Like, like he there was he had no counseling certifications. Mm-hmm. Or Noam Ali Khan, for example. Like, why did we put him on such a pedestal uh, to be such a like a scholarly figure when he didn't have those qualifications or? Or Kari Fatih, for example, like why why are we really holding him to such a such a such a high degree? And it's it got so bad to the point that people were like actually questioning their faith when like those uh, allegations against uh, Nak came out. Like, yeah, yeah. Like uh, they were like in spiritual crisis. Like why 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 is he held to that stand? I mean, standard to begin with. And that's gonna happen if you put your faith in people rather than in the knowledge, right? Rather than in, rather in, in the in the in the books that we were given by Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. And his messenger. So I think overall we had a very genuine discussion regarding FACE as an organization, their report, and we thoroughly dissected uh, the different allegations regarding uh, Qari Fatih. We also described um, how perhaps it can improve. Also, we described our community and the community, the community ethical mandate of how we should interact uh, with individuals that are undergoing these traumas and these trials and tribulations. And also, we described um, one of our one of our last points specifically was um which is inherently the lack of foundation that has led us to this issue um is our lack of educational veracity regarding islamic sciences and islamic knowledge um for those of you that have stuck around this far we want to thank you for listening and uh stay in tuned for our next podcast episode as well thank you for tuning in to this episode of the fourth podcast brought to you by morisco